going to give about 10 minutes of, um, you know, from my perspective as an industry analyst to give the kind of VR, AR association take on some of the meta trends that we're seeing, uh, or macro trends we're seeing, I should say, um, that really set the stage for all the themes we're going to be going over with our speakers for the next 45 minutes or so. So when we first started planning this event, um, and we picked the date, um, I suddenly realized and got excited that, um, you know, we're in the middle of October now, we're past the middle of October, and this is really going to be looked back on as a historic month for virtual reality um, for lots of different reasons. So, so far we've had Oculus Connect 3. Did anyone actually go to that, the Oculus Developer Conference? Nice. Um, a lot of cool things announced there. Um, you know, the kind of sexy headline that everyone was talking about was probably the touch controllers, although you could argue that those are way too late. Um, but a lot of the kind of behind the scenes stuff was also very cool. Um, you know, achieving 90 frames per second with lower processing power, um, you know, PCs that are VR ready that are at a sub $500 price point, lots of things like that that bring VR um, kind of to more people. Um, likewise, the PlayStation VR uh, just came out. Um, same thing, bringing VR to more people. Um, right out of the gate, it's compatible with 40 million existing PlayStations. Um, and then lastly, we have, um, and of course there are a lot more events happening during the month, these are just some of the highlights. Um, we have uh, Google, which announced uh, Daydream View, or showed the specs for Daydream View. Um, and that likewise brings VR to more people, and it raises the bar for mobile VR. And mobile VR is an important theme that I'm actually gonna come back to. Now, um, one theme you can detect from all of this is that all these things are kind of lowering the consumer adoption barriers for VR, raising the capability, and, and I'll say it again, bringing it to more people. So I think that's a key theme we're gonna see going into 2017. Um, well, some of the predictions I have is that because we now have the three major HMDs on the market, the Vive, the Rift, and the PSVR, and then also some mobile VR solutions and some other standalones, there's gonna be a lot of price competition that starts to lower that uh, pricing barrier. We're also gonna see a continued acceleration of content, VR content and content libraries that create more compelling reasons for the mainstream public to adopt VR and hand over those big bucks for, for a headset at some level. Um, and it's not really gonna just be uh, the type of content that we now think of VR, which is a lot of gaming and entertainment, but also filling in a lot of gaps with kind of lower hanging fruit, such as live action capture of things like sports um, or things like user-generated content and really just filling up those content libraries to get more people compelled to adopt um, VR. Now the other reason I mentioned 2017 is because it's the 10-year mark from the last platform shift, which of course was the smartphone era um, that is marked by the 2007 introduction um, of the iPhone. And the other reason I mention that is because we're at kind of an iPhone 1 moment right now with VR. Um, few people often remember that the first year of the iPhone, before 2008 when the App Store came out, we were stuck with these like 16 or 17 apps. Um, and that really kind of limited the utility and the use case to the point of impacting its kind of unit sales and penetration within that first year. So the parallel, the historical parallel, right now with VR, is that there isn't enough content to really kind of compel that kind of smartphone level of kind of device sales of like hundreds of millions of units in, in the US. We're just not there yet. And then conversely, content creators, without that installed base of devices, find it hard to justify the business case of um, investing you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars in um, high-end or long-form or high-production quality content. So it's a classic chicken and egg challenge we see at the early stages of a lot of emerging tech marketplaces. So that tells me kind of two things. One is that content is going to be king, just like it was in lots of other kind of legacy media. We're very bullish and supportive of content at the VRAR Association, and not just the content itself, but all the supporting parts. Um, the camera rigs, the compression technology. We have uh, Ryan here from uh, Visby. Um, you know, working on really cool codecs around compression technology. Um, a lot of good stuff like that. We're very bullish on that kind of ecosystem growing in the value chain through all of those different parts. And the second thing that this tells me is that because there is a kind of chicken and egg situation here, the nearer term opportunity is going to be with hardware that has that lower consumer barrier to entry, which right now gets back to my earlier point about uh, mobile VR, um, and of course we had uh, Daydream View come out, um, and Google really kind of building a development ecosystem around that kind of 
mobile VR proposition um, and bringing some of those barriers down. Now to kind of quantify that a bit in terms of the mobile VR opportunity, if you look at um, the, the number of um, head mounted display unit sales um, in the US according to IDC, and this is just you know, tethered PC or console VR, high-end VR, or what I like to call heavy VR, um, it's now uh, this year going to reach about 2 million units in sales. By 2020, that's projected to be about 64 million, which is great, and we're very bullish and supportive and psyched about that growth. But if you compare that to the installed base of smartphones globally right now, it's 2.6 billion. So clearly the larger opportunity in terms of the installed base of addressable hardware that's in the market now. Now, of course, all those 2.6 billion um, units in smartphones aren't um, you know, VR compatible, but we believe in the next few um, hardware replacement cycles that will be the case. And also, mobile VR certainly is a very stripped down experience. There are a lot of things missing. We don't have positional tracking and room scale and a lot of these things we look forward to in VR. But the point is that in the short term, in terms of um, you know, broader penetration, um, it's something that's going to sway the masses, we believe, sooner. And I like to think of it as the gateway drug to you know, full-on heavy, heavy VR. Um, so um, it's also interesting. I think that you know, it's not just the near-term opportunity. It's also the long-term opportunity when we're talking about mobile VR. So it's the near-term opportunity for the reasons I mentioned. Lower barriers to adoption, lower price, all that. And then we're going to move into a phase where PC and console VR is really going to start to scale in terms of consumer adoption when the price comes down and it's really attracted by you know, those things we all are looking forward to, better quality, positional tracking, higher frame rates, um, room scale, higher um, resolution, all that good stuff. And then what's going to happen is we're going to move into what I call phase three, which is back to mobile VR, where it's the best of all worlds, where it's all those great features, but yet it's in a smaller package and untethered. And it's going to take a few kind of cycles of Moore's Law to get us to that point. But that's the point we're going to get to. And then also along the way, as we get to phase three, there are a lot of other kind of holy grail type you know, features of VR that we're going to move closer towards, such as photorealistic light fields, such as haptic feedback, all those great things. And the reason I really mention all of this is that for anyone looking at VR from a development perspective or from a business perspective, it really helps to follow these types of platform shifts and the trends of where things are going to really de determine where to place your chips from a development perspective with all these kind of different uh, platforms and consumer entry points. So uh, switching gears here and kind of winding down, um, I want to spend uh, the remaining part of this presentation in segueing to Carter and his discussion about AR. Um, you know, AR, a lot of the same dynamics um, are present. The nearer term opportunity is going to be with smartphone AR before we get to a day where um, kind of wearable and goggle based AR is going to be prevalent. A lot of that has to do with technical reasons, a lot of it has to do with cultural reasons and stylistic reasons. We're just kind of not quite there yet. Um, but it's important to look at AR because it's eventually going to be much bigger than VR. It's going to come later, but it's going to be bigger. So DigiCapital pegs it as a 3x um, delta between augmented reality and virtual reality in terms of the market size by 2020. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, the kind of commercial applicability of AR is going to be bigger. Um, there are other factors such as, you know, it's going to be big in enterprise and a lot of just kind of different verticals. But also, as an analyst, I always look at a... Uh, a metric that's called share of users time per day. And we use that when we're looking at things like TV and radio and mobile and you know what people are doing through their day. And AR, if you think about it, due to its kind of less immersive, um, you know, inherently less immersive state, is something that you can conceivably use all day without like running into walls and being fully immersed, as opposed to VR, due to its kind of full immersion, it's only really practical for a certain share of your day. So some of the reasons behind this kind of you know, huge difference in kind of market values when you look at AR. Um, now, it's interesting too, we're already starting to see um, some appeal, some consumer appeal with AR. When you look at its earlier and, yes, very much more primitive forms of AR, and it, it, I, I gotta dance on this carefully because whenever you bring up these examples in the context of AR, you know, 20 or 30 people jump down your throat that this is not true AR, and, and they're actually right. It's not. Um, but when you look at things like Snapchat 3D stickers, Pokemon Go, you know, this is a very basic form of a graphical overlay. True AR, of course, will be when we get to the day of having graphical overlays that are dimensionally accurate. 
in the way that they kind of interact with the physical world, and also, you know, they have accurate parallax effect and perspective and all that stuff. But, you know, the point is it doesn't really matter that this is not true AR. What matters is that this has given the world a taste of AR. Um, and, you know, I talked about gateway drugs earlier. This is going to be the gateway drug for AR, the same way that mobile VR was that gateway drug. So one of the takeaways of this presentation is that the VR AR Association condones gateway drugs and the use of, the use of gateway drugs. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's very important. I think that, you know, it's, it's given the world a taste of this kind of AR-like interface. So when it does get here, the adoption curve, I think, is going to be a lot more accelerated because people have already gotten, you know, that taste. Um, so, we're going to hear next from Carter, who's going to give us some examples of the actual real kind of um, destinations of AR, and the cool things that are happening, real life examples, some practical examples, and the things that Lenovo is doing today to kind of get to that vision. So, please join me in welcoming Carter.